Hello and welcome to episode 79 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am recording this in early May. I'm recording it in the morning with a cup of coffee rather than the evening with a, with a glass of wine, which is a nice change. It's pleasant to be here with the whole day stretching ahead of me. This week I am talking about the economics of beauty. I am talking about dahlias, how to split them, how to move them. I'm talking about red hot pokers, what I like and don't like about them, how to choose them, and I'm asking for recommendations. I also set out a few ad hoc business proposals. Nowhere better to think these through than than in a podcast. And I am recommending a lovely little essay about the English countryside, an audio essay, a podcast, you might call it. It's a fun episode. And I enjoyed recording it, and hopefully you will enjoy listening to it. So without further ado, let's hear The Week in Gardening. Hello and welcome to The Week in Gardening. This is the story of a series of hot days in early May 2020, recounted at the end of a series of cold days in mid-May 2020. For these reasons, the tone might be that of the, the wise old narrator, in a classic novelist framing device, recounting the the sins and folly of his impetuous youth. For I am talking about tender plants. Most of Monday was spent putting out tender plants for the frost to feed on over the last few days. Hopefully they have survived. I am recording this on, on the Thursday. And I think we had a pretty heavy frost last night. I'm waking up to all sorts of horrified gardeners' reports of potatoes collapsed, limp and lifeless on the soil. I am more concerned about newly put out dahlias. We will have to wait until until episode 80 of the Garden Log to see if they survived. But until then, let's get on and talk about what I was up to on Monday. Monday was a real rush forward day. The garden was over that incredibly tender new stage of early spring. Were it a a little foal born fresh each year, it would not be staggering and falling over and splaying its legs out anymore. It is maturing into a fine young stallion. You know what it's doing and where it's going. It is more vigorous. It has unfurling tree ferns. At last, they are always a a source of great excitement and worry. It's a huge temptation all winter long to go and poke around in the crowns and see if those magnificent monkey tails are there. Are they soft? Are they rotten? You have to resist so hard to just say, I'll I'll just scratch. I'll give them a little scratch with my thumbnail and see if it's green under there. And then of course you do, and of course it's green. And then you have this horrendous scar on the back of your monkey tail forever. It's very hard. It's an exercise in self-control, the equivalent of not checking on a cake halfway through its baking process. Anyway, they're now unfurling. They're at that fantastic giant squid glued to giant cigar tube stage. I always associate the tree fern with underwater things. I think it's because it's so odd and other and so alien to the English garden. And to me, I associate that with the creatures of the deep, the unexplored depths. And I think when tree ferns are out and in full bloom, they look like some magnificent feather-leaved coral something that you could brush past and they would retract those leaves straight back into their trunk. But at this stage, they remind me, with the tentacles half unfurled, of that little ammonite fossil relative. There's a, you know the ammonite, they look like a nautiloid, that little spiral of of shell with a, a Cthulhu tentacled head poking out of the end. There is a version in the fossil record of those with a straight trunk and little tentacled head at the end. And that's what the tree ferns remind me of at the moment. It's very exciting to see, and some of them have upwards of 20 ferns unfurling, the ones at the front, in the most sunlight. I'm increasingly 
realising that it is a myth that tree ferns need to be in the shade, particularly here in our weak and wimpy English sunshine. I think they like quite a bit of sun. The best ones I see certainly are not lurking at the back of some canopied space. They are at the front or in the middle of a good border with, with lots of stuff around them. We have tree ferns regressing backwards from, from sunlit at the first to, to deep and dark under the canopy at the back. And I can notice the difference in the last three years. The ones at the back are growing smaller fronds. They're doing that awful English tree fern trick of shrinking at the top until it looks like you have just screwed a, a regular woodland fern onto a tree stump. Hopefully, hopefully we can manage them with, with feed and love and care, but at some stage I think they might have to be picked up and marched towards the light. Anyway, after fiddling around with the tree ferns and looking at all of that stuff, I replaced one of the temporary semi-bedding beds. This is an island bed, a very strange island bed. It is an island bed because it was created around the trunks of two big old larch trees. And the larch trees are the, the two ends of this bed. The best way to describe it, I think, is if you imagine a little lead or pewter toy soldier, the kind that you might have seen in, in a box of your grandfather's things, hauled down from the attic from when he was in short trousers. One of those little fellows, someone from the Napoleonic campaign probably, and he will stand up with his rifle pointing out straight. And in order to keep him standing, there will be a little oval base around the bottom. And he is joined to that base at the soles of his feet. And the large trunks come down to our little oval bed, like the legs of that Napoleonic fusilier. We had lots and lots of tulips in there that have now gone over. And so I hauled them out wholesale. I'm treating this as a bedding display of tulips. They're all going to go straight into the compost heap because I think we want to try something new next year. And I don't want to run the risk of having a few leftover stray red tulips. I think that I'll be fancying something completely different next year. So they've all gone now into the heap. It's a pity because the bulbs definitely look like they had some flowering space in them. They could have come up again next year and probably pushed out some good flowers. Maybe I should have shoved them into wild areas. But it was a question of time. I really didn't have time to, to go around and do all of that. So I unfortunately composted them. And then I got out some of the dahlias from storage. I wince as I say it, had I only known how cold this week was going to be, I would not have done so. Anyway, I got some dahlias out of the, the dahlia store and got them out of their little soil. And I split some of them. You split dahlias, well I split dahlias, certainly, in the springtime. Because it causes an open wound. And really, one doesn't want to put it away for the winter with, with an open wound exposed to the soil. I think it's probably like human open wounds. You, you don't wound someone and then shove them in a, in a box full of mouldering soil for six months. You wound someone and then send them out walking in the alpine air to, to, to callus and scab and crust and heal. And so I have done it in the spring, chopped the dahlias into little bits. The key thing is to make sure that there is a, an eye, at least one eye, one little proto-bud on each section of, of dahlia, neck and tuber. And that means that there is a growth point and energy for the plant to renew itself. I tend to be more cautious and I take a whole collar. So I take a whole stalk with eye buds around it for each of my divisions and then I know it's going to race away. I'm very upset with these dahlias. We've had them for three years now, and this is the first serious division that they're having. And I'm upset because they have such unbelievably vast tubers. And it seems to me wasteful. They're here to put all of their energy into flowering. And yet all summer they have been working on these monsters. They look like sweet potatoes attached to it. They're that sort of size. And you think, could you have not? Could you have not produced a tuber maybe... 25% smaller and given me 25% more flowers? That surely was your job. It's very good and, and well in terms of survival tactics in the wild. 
to do this tuber storage mechanism. But in terms of survival tactics in the garden, you need to please the gardener. That's what these, these plants don't realize. Natural selection has changed. Now it is an appeal to my eye. You don't need to outcompete the weeds and come up hard after winter. I'll put you in a lovely warm shed and I'll pull away those nasty little weeds. You just give me lovely flowers. Anyway, I didn't worry about dusting the, the wounds and the cut tubers with, with sulfur. I try not to go through the middle of any tubers. I use a sharp knife and... I was doing this at the wrong stage. It's much easier to do this when you haven't got dahlias in growth. There's about an inch and a half of, of growth and proto leaf coming out onto these dahlias, which means I can't really turn them upside down on a hard surface and really peer between the roots and find the best place for my cut because I'll break that new foliage. When they are just a little bud, when they are just like a, a potato about to go over the edge into, into unsavoury budded potato, when they've just got those little nodules on them, that's the time to, to really divide them because you can lay them, you can turn them round, you can really, really examine them from all areas, find that, that one angle that takes you through the plant with the least collateral damage and do your business. Mine was a much, much cruder job, and there were some some of those large tubers that ended up pretty well sliced in half. And I took those off where they where they joined the collar, where they narrowed down to a little point, just to reduce the amount of open dahlia flesh suppurating in the in the soil. Those were the old dahlias, mainly the Bishop series and Downham Royal. Downham Royal is the, the very good, very green leafed pom pom purple dahlia and the bishop series will be familiar to to anyone who has an acquaintance with dahlias it's a dark foliage single flowered dahlia it was the gateway to, to dahlias coming back into fashion really it was suddenly rediscovered by those flowery enthusiasts who found dahlias overbred by people who discovered that actually these flowers are, are quite sensible these flowers don't look like something I would find in my grandmother's bathtub. They look like like nice, open, sunny, simple pieces of nature brought back into my garden. And suddenly they started springing up 10, 10 or, or 12 years ago. I remember seeing them in, in Fulham Palace in, in 2008, which is appropriate because Fulham Palace has been historically full of bishops. And now it had dahlias named after the bishops growing in there. Anyway, those dahlias were the harbingers of the dahlia renaissance. And I, like many, was, was resistant to the other dahlias at first. But now, now I am an addict. And I have reached the point where I think, well, I'm growing dahlias. But why do I want my dahlias to apologize for anything? I almost want something utterly overbred, ridiculous and fun. So we've been adding to, to those dahlias with some more vast and over-the-top dahlias. We're adding one called Glory van Nudwijk, which is vast dinner plate sized dahlia, half a foot across. It has a rich orange centre that fades into yellow as it gets away from the point at which it unfurls. It looks like grenadine folding into a tequila sunrise and it has that sort of aura of classiness as well and the other dahlia a similar coloring is david howard which is a rotund sort of semi pom-pom apricot colored dahlia with a red center where the petals are unfolding I think it looks like one of those videos that we used to watch in science class and a little biology and things like that. A video of a developing chicken fetus in the egg. And it's at that day five or six stage when it's very much a sack of yolk, but there is certainly a blob of blood in the middle. That's the kind of effect, but, but much prettier. And hopefully it'll only remind me of that. And everyone else who sees it will just see it as something glorious and good fun. As this is a, a bedding style bed, I have gone full over the top with it. So I'm putting in some wonderfully big things. In the centre there is a Musa Bastu, a hardy banana, one of the pups that I took from last year, that is going to rise above the thing and send its big old leaves down to it to hug it. I've also put in a lot of canna angelique. Canna is that nice plant with the banana-like leaves, but are much smaller, much more upright. 
and the version Angelique that I've got has dark foliage, a dark purple and green toned foliage, more interesting foliage than some of the very, very black leafed cannas. It has tones of green in there and that the purple has changed as the leaves come out and it has wonderful peachy pink flowers that are just going to go so well with my, my eggy David Howard and my over the top banana. And already in the bed are several clumps, probably six, seven clumps of Nephophia, the, the red hot poker. A, a red hot poker that I divided from some other beds elsewhere in the garden in the autumn. And this one is called Elvira. Elvira is quite a good red hot poker. It has a nice neat grassy foliage, which I think the, the poker is generally underappreciated for. When you get a good clump that establishes well, the grass foliage is very nice. I, I enjoy it quite a lot. And it has a solid coloured flower. It has a flower that is entirely orange all the way up. It has a, um, a more of a classy feel to it. It's the red hot poker equivalent of the the bishop series of dahlias and for a similar reason i think that i am starting to go off it i think that again we want something more ridiculous some of those real classic two-tone red hot pokers that look like they have a big bright rocket nose cone at the front and this little yellow afterburner thing below i think that this this bed needs to be really really over the top Having said which, my favourite stage of the, the red hot poker life is that stage just before the flowers truly open, when they're coming up and they're a big triangle wedge with, with no fully opened flowers yet. They have that wonderful potential energy about them. There is so much yet to come and they are unspoiled and pristine. Anyone who's seen one of the red hot pokers flowering for a whole summer will know that they, they flower in a fairly interesting way, almost from, from the bottom up. They flower like a flame travelling along a sparkler. And as anyone who's held a sparkler will know, the flame is just as bright when it's about to burn out, when it's reaching your hand. It burns with the same intensity all the way through, but it's not quite the same. It doesn't feel quite the same as when the whole thing is fresh and new and ready and you're writing your name and you know that you could write a whole essay in the air with this things. When it's in the last couple of seconds, there's a sense of, of things passing about it. There's a vast, ashy piece of wire that it has already passed down. And at the end of the summer, the, the red hot poker flowers look like that. They still have the, the bright colour, but behind them is a big, long, ashy beard of spent flowers. But we can't hold that against them. So I will be going for some, some more over-the-top red hot pokers, I think, in the years to come. If anyone has any particular favourites or recommendations, then feel free to email me them at thegardenlookpodcast at gmail.com. On Wednesday, I was doing some long grass meadow watching some some editing in the little areas that we're doing the the semi perennial trick in where we have little planting holes with with perennials in them the the flomis the flomis amazonica is going well in there i'm starting to see a little little plant spire i was looking at some of the other beds and some of the newer plants that we've put in plants that i haven't grown before we are growing Thermopsis for the first time, Thermopsis villosa. Thermopsis is often called the, the false lupin or the Carolina lupin. It has a classic lupin-shaped flower spike, but in a bright sulphur yellow, almost a laburnum yellow. Actually, they look like truncated laburnum flower pendants turned upside down. It's definitely a legume. You can see that looking at the, the shape of the flower. But even the, the leaves, those, those pea green leaves as they come out, look, look, leguminous to the core. I was very excited when we found this because I had looked at pictures of it and thought about getting it for a while. And then we went out to a nursery and found it in little square nine centimetre pots. 
And the best thing about finding it in these pots was that it was just coming into new growth. And all of the new growth was right at the edges of these pots, right in the corners, thrust up against the plastic, which tells you that this is a vigorous spreader of the plant. It tells you that it has sent as much of itself as it can sideways until it has hit the wall, when it has run straight up them like a gecko and come up. And that excites me because I have a lot of area to fill in certain parts of the garden. And I can see that this is going to be one of those plants that will run sideways, will clump massively, will take a sharp spade like a champion and be broken into lots of bits and, and go everywhere. So we'll have yellow for, for a long time to come. And it's been in flower now for a couple of weeks and shows no sign of slowing down. Still looks fresh, no ashy beard for the Thermopsis. I'll keep you updated with its progress, but so far I think it's going to be a, a very good choice, a nice addition to the garden. There's lots of blue tones. There are fantastic wisterias out. There are various floribunda and sinensis species. Quite a nice floribunda cultivar called, called Isai, which I put in, in a bed out in the lawn, standard tree form, and lashed it to a scaffolding pole. I think I'm going to get an extra one of those for, for a bit of formal symmetry, a, a mirror point elsewhere in the garden, like in the, the little secret garden in Regent's Park, where they have the standard wisterias growing at various points in an otherwise chaotic herbaceous and rose border to, to give an anchoring of, of stability to the thing. So that's, that's going to be a fun project coming up. The whole thing there is so unbearably beautiful, particularly when a cloud comes over the sun and the blues aren't quite so washed out and there are forget-me-nots and petals all over the lawn from, from the clematis and the wisteria elsewhere. It is almost almost achingly achingly attractive and there are little wild flowers everywhere just looking utterly perfect it's almost too much to take in i was thinking about this on wednesday in terms of supply and demand a supply and demand economy of beauty in the sense that when that first aconite comes out in the, the bare and gray of late january it's worth a million gold coins a petal a, a anything you you are so happy to see it and that's because no one is selling beauty in late january but now now i'm walking past blue veronica and meadow buttercups growing together in in the shorter parts of the meadow and then there's cow parsley and camassias where the, where the grass is longer under the apple blossom and there's forget-me-nots and herb robert all intermingled and growing wild over these tree stumps that we never got round to to getting rid of and all of these things i'm walking past without noticing I'm walking past because I left my secateurs in the shed and needed to go back and get them. And the economy has changed and we have a, a glut of beauty in the garden. We have a mountain of it, a huge stockpiling surplus. And you couldn't sell me an aconite now. You give me an aconite, I'm not going to give you a million gold florins. I'll, I'll give you one florin. I like it still, but there's so much else. There's dandelions next to it. There's just a brighter colour and I've got a hundred thousand of them in the, in the rough grass. We are living in, in plentiful times. This is a bull market. I am going to ignore the fact that there might be a, a little beauty crash coming up in the, in the midsummer slump. And I'm going to live like the good times are never going to end. I suppose that's not really the lesson to take away from it. The lesson to take away from it is to, to set a little alarm in one's pocket to go off every eight minutes. And when it goes off, to just stop and look around and see what is there, what is beneath the feet, what is this tapestry of, of green and daisy, uh, how I would have loved to have seen it just a few months ago. On Thursday, I came in rather than my normal Friday because it was a bank holiday Friday and we were making the garden ready for the long weekend. Not that it will have any visitors because social gatherings are still banned. We are still living in, in times of lockdown. But it is nice to have that rhythm still, the build towards a weekly peak. We always like 
two to get the garden at its very, very best when we close the gate on it on a Friday afternoon so that whatever adventures it has over the weekend, when it is a host space, when it is no longer a workplace, but it is a place for, for cavorting and delighting. So whatever they, they can do, they do in the best of surroundings. And we've kept that attitude up because if we let standards slip, then, then where will we be? I enjoy the the excitement, the acceleration, the final few hours when you realise that you've left so many jobs, so many jobs still to do, and the weekends in, in a bit of an excited rush, and then you feel you, you've earned that end of end of working week beer. I, I think it would be fun to work in a very, very beautiful, very, very well funded, magnificent little country house hotel where you've got a dedicated team pitching up for the weddings that are going to to be held each weekend and you know that your work is going to be in the background of the most important day of some people's lives and photos are going to be looked at forever it would be a really nice feeling maybe one day i've also thought how is this for a business plan it'd be quite good to set up as a sort of plant wedding consultant for these wedding spaces, not necessarily hotels, but anywhere that wants to host weddings or, or big events. And you'd be their horticultural photography consultant, set up with a, a photographer who knows about light and who knows about the whims and wants of, of brides and bridesmaids, and go to this place and say, I can sell you a guaranteed picture-perfect plant combination for your photos any month of the year. And yes, it might be an aconite in January and they'll have to get down on the floor and lie next to it. But I can sell you June roses and I can sell you October dahlias. And I will tell you how to create that that flowering arch that perfectly frames your your rosy-cheeked maidens. It'll be a good little proposition, I think. You'd have to pop in a couple of times a year and, and check and, and then maybe they'd send you some, some pictures of the or the big days and you'd feel, ah, I, I really I really helped people's lives in, in some way. That can be my next venture. Anyway, I don't really need to tell you the details of Friday. It involved edging shears and croquet lawns and mowers, both cylinder mowers and rotary mowers, and generally striping lawns and neatening. Neatening the the lick the thumb and scrub the cheek of the garden, send it out ready to meet the weekend. And so I left, back in the car and once more through the deserted streets of London to my, my little lockdown refuge where I am recording this. I must get on with things. I only have a very limited time to record this while while various people are people are sleeping, so I, I must get on and tell you about any recommendations I have this week. My recommendation this week is for a podcast, a very, very short podcast, only 13 minutes long, so you've all got the time for that. It's from a series that Radio 3 has been doing for a long time called The Essay. They are little 15-minute segments about something. Normally it's a theme that stretches over the week. And last week, the, the recommendations were about places of sanctuary, places where writers go to to escape. And some of them aren't very good. But one of them is fantastic. It's by Alan Hollinghurst, the writer, who has written some of my favourite books. He writes brilliantly about London, about the streets of London and plants and, and parks particularly. Uh, the things that go on in the parks are of, of a unique character as well. But um, he is writing about a walk, a series of walks done from the Somerset House in which his parents moved to on retirement, in which he largely grew up. And he's writing about how they change as his parents grow older and his mother becomes a widow, and what they mean to him and what they meant to her. And it's a wonderful piece of writing about the, the English countryside and about finding one's place within it, and about discovering new places within a landscape that one holds as, as utterly familiar. 
So I really recommend that. That's the essay from Radio 3 and the Alan Hollinghurst episode particularly. Nothing else to recommend. A little thank you. Last week I mentioned that I had set up an account where I could be bought a coffee for people who wanted to say thank you for, for an episode of the podcast. And I would like to say a huge, huge thank you to Anna, to John and to Jonathan and to the, the three anonymous people who bought me a coffee. You have paid for June's hosting of the podcast completely, which is magnificent. So thank you very much for that. If anyone wants to, to tip a coin into the hat for July, then they can go to ko-fi.com. That's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash Ben Dark. I'm going to try and get an episode out next week as well. So look out for that because I think that a lot of people will want to hear about how those poor tender dahlias so wounded and thrust back into the soil have been faring. But until then, I hope that everyone is as safe and as sane as is possible. I hope that if you have a garden, you, you manage to get out into it a little bit. You don't need to do any gardening necessarily. Just, just wander around and, and look at that beauty glut. Or take a walk around the streets. I'm really enjoying this, this new chalking the name of wildflowers on the road. There's a little house down by me that's chalked all of the wildflowers growing around the wall. And it's a nice way to, to stop and, and think about the, the things that surround us once more. It's also it's also very nice to be reminded of the absurdity of the names of English wildflowers. I wonder if they've got the correct names, because wildflowers have vastly different names all over the country. I hope they're using a proper cockney glossary for our South London weeds, and that we're not getting some sort of Hebridean variety of wildflowers. If not, I shall knock on the door and demand to speak to their misguided young botanists. Anyway, it's been wonderful speaking to you this week, and I will do so again shortly. Thank you very much and goodbye.